Shall we bow our heads together? Our gracious Father, again as we open your word, we ask for your spirit, that you would open our hearts, you would open our minds, you would open our understanding, that you would fill us with your spirit, with your grace, that truly Jesus would live out his life in us, and that we would see him, and by beholding him, we would be changed. This is our prayer in his name. Amen. What would you do for your reputation? I suppose all of us had different times where, you know, we felt like we needed to do something. Maybe, you know, you need to do something to protect it. You know, there was something going on, something being said, whatever, and you felt like you needed to protect your reputation. Maybe you felt like, you know, kind of like we see these advertisements all the time about improving your credit score, you know, you need to do something to improve your reputation. Be nice to say that none of us ever have a problem, but maybe sometimes, you know, there are just certain circumstances where, you know, it's not really bad, but I'd just like it to be a little better. Maybe you'd like to change it altogether. You know, we often hear, and you know, the pastor loves sports illustrations, about a coach coming into a team that's not doing well, and we have to change the culture. We have to change the way we think. In essence, saying, we've got to change our reputation. We're losers. We don't want that reputation anymore. We have to change our attitude, etc., what would you do in order to change your reputation? To maybe restore it if something had happened? What would you be willing to do? I can't help but think a little bit about God's reputation. You know, how would you rate it if you were to score it? Would you say His reputation is excellent? You know, it's five out of five stars or whatever you do. Now, probably most of us would agree here. This is probably not the right group to ask that question, is it? Most of us would agree. It's excellent. But, you know, probably if we were honest, or at least some people we know, that would say, well, you know, it's good. It could be improved upon. You know, there are some things. Maybe there would be even some that would say, well, it's kind of average. The truth is there are those out there who think God has a bad reputation. What really concerns me is how often they have a bad image of God. His reputation is not real good because of us as His representatives. And we profess to be Christians to represent Christ, and what we really do is we misrepresent Him. Is God's reputation damaged? You see, the damage started in heaven with one angel who professed to be trying to help God out. I wonder how often we profess to be helping God out, and really what we're doing is we're destroying what is perfect. But God's reputation was damaged there in heaven, and from ever since, Satan has been blaming everything that he's done on God. It's his fault. And what's sad is there are a lot of people who believe that, who have bought in to that lie. Our scripture in Philippians chapter 2, starting with verse 5, Paul says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. To have the mind of Christ in us, wouldn't that be nice? who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, Jesus who was one with God the Father. It wasn't robbery. It wasn't something God was doing. Jesus was doing that wasn't really His, as opposed to the enemy who tried to be equal with God when it wasn't. But made Himself of what? No reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. 
and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The mind of Jesus, is it in you? Is that what people see when they see you? You remember after Pentecost, it was interesting with the disciples that people noticed that they had been with Jesus. You see, they had adopted His character, His characteristics. They had the mind of Christ in them. They had His attitude. They had His humility. They had His service. He's willing to sacrifice and serve others. And they were willing to be obedient. Obedient even to the point of death. I wonder, is that something that describes us? And if not, why not? Would you be willing to give up? Would you be willing to give up your reputation? Would you be willing to give up your honor? To give up your rights that you have, that you treasure? Would you be willing to give up your freedom? Would you be willing to give up your very life in order to honor Jesus? Is there anything that you would hold on to that you would not be willing to sacrifice for Him? Because if there is, it will cost you everything. What would you be willing to do to honor Jesus? You see, really there's only one thing I can do to honor Jesus. That's to allow Him to live out His life in me. We come to a table, a table this morning, with a simple reason. We come here to remember, to remember something that we all know, but something that we need to be reminded of again, to remember the cost that it cost Jesus, it cost God His only Son, it cost Jesus His life, to remember the sacrifice that Jesus was willing to humble Himself and take on the role of a servant, of a slave. He was willing to set aside His reputation. We come to remember the forgiveness that can only be found at one place, and that is at the foot of the cross. It can only be found at one place. But it can be found by anyone at any time. It doesn't matter what you've done or haven't done. What's happened in your life, you are invited to the foot of the cross where you can find forgiveness. The hope. That hope that we have in Jesus. That hope that this book, Philippians, starts with. You know, Paul talks about him who will complete a good work that he has started in you. There is only one hope of that work ever starting, continuing, or finishing, and that is in Jesus. He is the only one that can truly finish what has been started. To remember the grace, that which none of us deserve, that which none of us are entitled to, but which is freely given and offered to each and every one of us. We come to remember the love. The love of God as demonstrated, as poured out in His only Son who gave everything for us. We come to a table to remember. We come to remember what Jesus was willing to do. We come to remember what Jesus was willing to give, but we also come to remember what we are called to do because as His disciples, as His followers, we are called to be willing to give as He has given, to sacrifice as He has sacrificed. We are called to give everything. We are called very simply to take up our cross Jesus puts it simply in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And he said to them, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross when it's convenient. Daily. And follow me. 
You see, my friends, really the simple truth is, as Christians, we have but one calling, that is to take up our cross each and every day and follow Jesus. Are you following Jesus? We come to a table to be reminded of what our focus should be, of what our purpose should be, of the reason we are here. I like the New Century Version, the way it puts it. Jesus said to all of them, if people want to follow me, they must what? Give up the things they want. Now, I do realize by the grace of God, what I want can be changed and transformed to where I want things that are appropriate. But apart from the grace of God, what I want is what? One simple little word. What I want is sin. That's what I want. Paul talks about it, you know, in Romans 7. We're not going to go there. But Paul talks about the struggle. You know, what I want to do, I don't do. And what I don't want to do, I do. I wish I couldn't relate to Paul so well, but I do. All of us do. Jesus says, if I want to follow him, I must give up the things I want. And the only way I can do it is by his grace. They must be willing to give up their lives daily to follow me. Are you willing to give up your life? Are you willing to give up everything to follow Jesus? Because you see, that's what it requires. Jesus doesn't ask me to do anything for Him that He hasn't already done for me. He was willing to give up everything. And He simply asked me to be willing to do the same. And yet the irony is, really when I give up everything I have, I really give up pretty much nothing in order to have everything Jesus has. What are you willing to give? Are you willing to give up your reputation? Well, you don't understand. It's important. I have a good name in the community. And Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't care about our reputation. But I worry that sometimes we're more worried about our reputation than God's. You see, Jesus was willing to give up his reputation that he might rightly represent and restore the reputation, the image, the truth about God. Are you willing to give your time? Well, you know, I mean, I do give the Sabbath. That's one day a week. And certainly we should set that day apart and we should make it special and it should be different than any other day of the week because God has blessed it. He has sanctified it. He has made it different. But, you know, God may need my time on Monday night. He may need my time Thursday morning earlier than I really care to get up. Is all of my time available to God, talents, whatever they may be. And you may want to say, well, you know, Pastor, I really don't have any. So you're saying God didn't give you anything. I find that hard to believe, and I don't find any scriptural basis for it. Now, no, you may not have the talents of somebody else, but God has given you some, and the truth is that maybe the reason you don't feel like you have any talents is because you're like that person. You've gone and you've buried it instead of using it to gain more. That's what God wants us to do with the talents He has given us, to use them, to allow Him to multiply them in our lives. Put in a little plug for you here, Eddie. You know, there's a seminar and a workshop this afternoon. If you don't think you have any talents, maybe you can go and you might find out you have some. Maybe they're not well developed. Maybe you need to work on them a little bit. But, you know, you might have some. Might be some other areas. Ultimately, are you willing to give your life, everything you have, for Jesus? You see, the disciples gave everything. It took them a little while. They had some issues early on, but they ultimately gave everything. Are you a disciple? Are you a follower of Jesus? Are you obedient? Are you obedient to the point of death? The disciples, all of them but one, died as a what? As a martyr. And the only reason John the Beloved did not die as a martyr was why? 
simply because they couldn't kill him. They tried. They tried to boil him in oil. They tried to kill him. They couldn't do it. So they sent him off to an island where he'd be all by himself. And there they thought, at least now we've taken care of the problem. But you know what? God had a plan for John on that isle. It was called a revelation. A book that is significant to us today as it reminds us that God is coming soon. And while Satan has a counterfeit and a plan to try to lead all astray, God has told us, you don't need to be deceived. I've told you what the devil is up to. I've told you his plan that you be not deceived. The disciples died as martyrs. You know, there's a lot of stories we could look at. A couple of my favorites, they didn't actually die as martyrs. But, you know, there was that story about Daniel and the lion's den and how everybody had made these plans to eliminate Daniel. But the problem is, you see, the only way I can die as a martyr is if God says so, not the devil. And God shut the lion's mouth. There's, of course, my favorite story. I think one of the favorite stories, anyway, in the Bible. That of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I just love that statement of faith they make to Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to think about what you're telling us. Our God will deliver us, but even if He does not, we will not serve your gods. You know, it almost sounds like a contradiction of terms, doesn't it? You know, our God will deliver us, but if He doesn't... But you see, that's what true faith is. God may deliver me here and now, but what I really know is at some point God is going to deliver me. It may be today, it may be tomorrow, it may be at the second coming, but God is going to deliver me, and there is nothing that Nebuchadnezzar or anybody else can do if I am faithful to God. I will be delivered. And you see, the truth is, if we live to see Jesus come, all of us are going to face that day when we're not allowed to buy or sell, when there's a death decree that says all these people that are not following the system that we've set up, we're going to have to get rid of them. That's the problem. But once again, God has a plan of deliverance. Are we willing to be obedient to the point of death? It may take your life, it may not. But are you willing to be obedient to the point of death? That is having the mind of Christ. To be obedient to the point of death. It means to have the mind of Christ. It means to be like Jesus. It means that we're to love others as Jesus loves us. And you see, the real truth is, the only way I will really love you unconditionally in a Christ-like way is to experience that love. Because it's impossible for me to share what I have not experienced. And maybe the reason that we often don't love others the way God loves us is because we have never truly understood how much God loves us. To be obedient unto death is to be willing to forgive others as Jesus forgives us. I wonder, is there someone, is there something in your life? Well, pastor, you just don't understand what that person did, and I can't forgive them until they ask. I don't remember Jesus waiting until I asked to come and give his life for me. In fact, if he would have waited for me to ask, he would have never come. You see, forgiveness is a grace thing. It's about what I need, not what I deserve or even what I've asked for. Are you willing to forgive others as Jesus does as they stretched Him out on the cross and He prayed, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Well, see, you don't, they knew what they were doing. No, they really didn't. And even if they did, God is still willing to forgive. Are you willing to do to others as you would want them to do to you? That nice little golden rule. Do you practice it in your life? You see, to have the mind of Christ, 
to make myself of no reputation, to be obedient unto death, is to be willing to do what Jesus did. And that was to always do what was best for others, not what, what is best for me. The only way it will happen, the only way I will ever be obedient to the point of death, the only way I will ever be willing to give up my reputation, the only way that I will have the mind of Christ in me. Paul makes it simple. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live but what? Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by what? Faith. By faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, folks, it's really very simple. As I come to this table, I have but one question to ask. Have you, have I been crucified with Christ? Is Christ living in you? Is Christ living in me? Would you like to invite Jesus to live in you, to live out His life in you? If you would, then you're invited to come to this table to partake of His broken body, to partake of His shed blood, those emblems representing Christ's life. But I do not take them lightly because Christ paid a price that I might come to His table, that I might accept His life that was lived perfect, that I might accept His death that I deserved that I might be ready to meet Him when He comes in the clouds of glory. You say, well, Pastor, I don't know if I'm ready for that. Well, you know, it's interesting. We have a simple service to help prepare the hearts for that. It's called the ordinance of humility. It's called the foot washing service. You remember Jesus washed Peter's feet there, and Peter said, Lord, no, you can't wash my feet. Do you remember what Jesus said? If I don't wash you, you have no part with me. My friends, if Jesus doesn't wash us, we have no part. When I go to the foot washing service, it is a little mini baptism. It is a reminder that as Jesus came to serve, I'm called to serve. But it is also a reminder that whatever the stains, whatever the soils, whatever may have happened in my life, there is only one person who can wash it away, and that is Jesus. The simple song, you remember it, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. As we separate for the foot washing, I invite you, whether you participate or not, to remember there is only one who can wash away your sins, and that is Jesus. And that I invite Him to wash away my sins. I invite Him to change. I invite Him by accepting the bread and the wine to live out His life in me. Our gracious Father, we are thankful for the sacrifice, even though we really cannot begin to comprehend the sacrifice you made for us. May we catch a glimpse, and may it begin to change our hearts, our lives, that we might truly have the mind of Christ, that we might be willing to take upon ourselves no reputation, that we might be willing, like Jesus, to be obedient to the point of death, even a death on the cross. May we all, like the Apostle Paul, be able to say, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. We thank you that you are willing to live out your life in us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.